Can you tell me your name? Uh, Peter Sala. Peter Sala. And could you tell me uh, how long you've been in the Hudson Valley? All of my life. I'm 80. 80 years old. And can you well, tell no, me? I was here uh, seven day, nine years and three months. I moved here when I was about a year old. And um, can you describe the Hudson Valley from your own personal experience, what you love well, about the Hudson Valley? Well, we started, I was in Windale, I lived in Wingdale, New York, which is east of here, and uh, we had a fire and a house burned down, and we moved to Dover. My father was, uh, you know, came from Italy, and he couldn't speak English, and and he worked in the, the quarries, and he worked in the, in making timbers or for railroad ties. And uh, then from there, we, we went, went to school. And I thought it was quite clever. My dad, my dad says that we won't speak Italian in the house anymore because he wanted to learn English. So we spoke English in school and spoke English in home. And uh, it was because my father insisted we spoke English. But when we went to school, we couldn't speak English. So that was. Was the neighborhood you grew up in a, a, a strong Italian neighborhood? Oh yeah, Vermont? without without a doubt, Every, everybody had their own little clique. I, I find out now, like my father made wine and Beppe Spicciola made wine, and different people make wine and different kind of wines, and they grew in their own grapes and everything. And one of the guys had a real nice house, and there was always real nice girls that lived there. I mean, you know, matured women, and I didn't know what they were. <laughs> well, now I found out what they were, right? But everybody had their own little specialty, and. Uh, it was a house of ill repute, right? So the, the guy made wine and the guy did everything like that. And it was an interesting life. We, we never knew we were poor, you know. I found out later when I left and that we were supposed to be poor, but I don't think we were. What brought your family to the Hudson Valley? Well, my dad, my dad uh, came from Italy and went through Dover when he went to Lee, Massachusetts. And uh, he was a boarder in my grandmother's house. And she had five girls. And we found out later as we were talking, that I said to my mother, Zia Anna, Zia Alice, which is aunt, Aunt Alice, aunt. No, they're all girls and they all married boarders. So my grandmother was very smart too because she married all five girls off the boarders. And then my father moved back down to Dover and then he ended up working for a barrio. He was a powder man, dynamiter. And he had very little formal education, but he could, he could do anything. And matter of fact, for Arborio, he did a lot of the land surveying by telling what kind of a tree grew there. And did the root go straight down? If it did, it wasn't rock. If it spread out, it could be gravel. And uh, he had the knowledge to do that. And I don't know where he learned it from, but he was a powder man. And then he left there and he went to the, Har the Hudson River State Psychiatric Center. He was working in the boiler room. Again, I don't know where he learned that. But, uh, you know, we kept learning from him and and that's how we came to the Hudson Valley, and I've been in the valley all my life. Um, can you tell me your like what your job was, what uh, your career was? In well, Hudson it was never planned. Uh, it's more, it more was like, well, I'm tired of this. I have no more to learn. And you know, I've been a lumberjack. I've uh, trained horses. I broke horses. Uh, I was uh, a deep sea diver. I was a sailor. Uh, I was a waiter at the Alumni House at Vassar College where I met my wife, whose grandfather worked on the railroad bridge years ago when they built it. And uh, I've, I've done many, many jobs, and I ended up uh, working for someone in a salvage business uh, outside of my career in the Navy, and I ended up with a salvage yard in Poughkeepsie, and that's where I retired from. And then I went into the real estate business, and I kind of retired from that, although I'm still doing that. But I've been lucky I can make a living doing what I loved. So you name it, I've probably done. I've, I've been into, I've done all sculpturing and art and I love to fish and I go to the Keys fishing. I, I'm a very, very, very fortunate man. I, I have a wife that's the same wife I've had for 55 years. We have three children. Uh, one is with IBM in Burlington. My other one, that's my second son. And uh, I just started thinking if I, First son, who was, I, I had another son that I lost. He was murdered in police. I, I, I'm sorry. And then I have a daughter that's a nurse. 
and she's very, very successful, and our grandchildren are very successful. I have a granddaughter who just joined the Coast Guard, and she just graduated from boot camp, which I'm very proud of, and I have another grandson that's uh, starting to be an engineer. So we're very, very blessed, and, and uh, what, what else can I tell you? Um, I'm sorry about, about my son. I haven't thought of him in a long time. <coughs> Um, can you tell me about your relationship to trains? I know you said your mother or your wife's father worked on the train. My, my grand, her grandfather. Um, did he ever s tell you stories? No, I never, met, I never met him. I just know she keeps telling me that her grandfather, the blast went off and he got all scratched up with gravel and everything else. And, but the bridge has been a part of my life even when I didn't know it. We lived near on Creek Road, which was near the railroad tracks. So we used to see the train go by. And, and the, the bridge carried double tracks two ways. I mean, there was trains coming and trains going on that bridge and loaded with coal. Uh, Ed Lodi remembers the, the equipment, but I remember they were all loaded with coal. And uh, strangely, you'd be sleeping in the middle of the night, you'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning, and it wasn't because the train went by and shook the house. It was because the train didn't go by. I mean, it, it just, in your computer mind, you, you, the train didn't go by. You woke up, oh, and then you go back to sleep. And, uh, and then, like I say, we, we lived next to the tracks there, quite away from the track, but the trains went by. And then uh, I was at a uh, some kind of a meeting, and Bill Sape was the, the guest speaker, and he spoke about the bridge. And it just like he reached out and grabbed me, you know, I, I was immediately interested because I was into salvages. We used to take down buildings and stuff like that, and I just dreamed of taking that bridge down, right? And it seems strange. I mean, here I am telling you, hoping that what I tell you will help to preserve that bridge, but I got to admit to you, at one time, my biggest dream was to take it down. I mean, I, I would have taken it down. The last piece they put in, I would have taken out first. And then being a salvage diver, I would have, uh, when I got close to shore, would have dropped it in the river and pulled it out with beaching gear. So I went from wanting to take it down, dreaming of taking it down, to now I hope it becomes a reality. Even though Ed said it costs thirty million dollars to paint it every year, they don't paint the Beacon Bridge every year, and Arborio didn't store his equipment in buildings because if you stored them in a building, they rust away. They left them outside. They, it rained on it, the water fell off, and and uh, the, the, it wasn't destroyed. So maybe we don't have to paint the bridge. We don't paint the Beacon Bridge. So. I don't know, but that's how I got involved with this. Bill Sape was there, and he was the guest speaker, and that started, and he asked me if I would help him, and from there I went to loaning my trucks and climbing up grades. It was like 45 degrees with a four-wheel drive. Took for no place to turn around. I had the back down and big stones, and you can't believe what Ed, what Bill Sape did on that bridge, but that's how I got started on a bridge. And then one of the real things I liked about the bridge was we helped put up the the flagpole, and I was always happy about having the flagpole. The flag only lasted about three months, and the wind shredded it, but there were so many people that were involved in the bridge, like even with the, with the flagpole. We had to take the flagpole down one time because the, the top clevis, the rope was broke, and the guy was uh, Paul Sullivan. He's a town justice, been there for 20 years, and her son, who was uh, 16 or 17, he came out to watch us and help us take the flag down. So there's people from all walks of life that had worked on that bridge. And my feeling with the bridge, it's almost like you get out in the middle of that bridge and you get like a religious feeling or a holy feeling. You get to know more about yourself than you ever did before because you've looked at it, you've seen it. But when you go out on that bridge, it does something to you spiritually. I don't know why, I don't know what it is. But you go out on that bridge, and, and then we had people that tried to go out there and wanted to go out there and tried and tried and couldn't make it because of, you know, fear of height. But Paul Sullivan worked there, uh, Kyle Ball worked there, and we had people from all farmers and, and construction workers and, and myself, a Navy man, and everything else. So all kind, I mean, we probably had, I don't know, seven, eight, nine hundred people that volunteered on the bridge, shoveling and moving stones and doing things that were impossible. So that's how I was involved with the bridge. What is, in your opinion, the state of the bridge when you were up there? Did you get to see the fire damage? Was that well, I fire? saw the fire damage because I was coming north on the new arterial. 
but if I remember correctly, I remember seeing it smoking and I see a lot of traffic, but I, I, I vaguely remember turning off, I don't know what street it is there, to go home. I didn't want to get caught in traffic. But uh, when I was on the bridge, I mean, the bridge looks structurally sound to me. And the bridge is alive. Because as you walk out there, you carry a piece of slate in your pocket or something, and they have a slip joint in the railroads. And, and you put a mark across them in the morning, and as the bridge heated up, the marks would go apart. Sometimes that mark would be probably four inches apart. So the bridge is, bridge is actually moving. You can hear it sometimes. But it it's kind of has its own life, and it has a, a religious feeling to me. I don't know why I get it when I go up there. You, you kind of feel like you feel like you're about that big, you know? What's the view like from the top of that bridge? It's, you can't describe it. You have to see it. I mean, you... You look up the river and you look down the river and you look at Poughkeepsie, you see Poughkeepsie like you never saw it before. And you look toward Highland and you look down and you see the little boats going back and forth. It's, I can't describe it to you. you but I would, I would be shocked if, if you went out there and didn't get, get a feeling like you've never had in your life. Um, can you describe some of the specific things you did when you were volunteering to help? Oh, God, we, you know, shovel snow, we fix fences, we move huge boulders as big as that desk. I mean, these stones were three foot by four foot by seven foot long granite stones, and we moved them with bars and jacks, and we, we went and got equipment. We took loose pieces off the bridge. We put in the, the, uh, the guard system, so if anybody went on the bridge, we could tell they were there. Uh, to delivering papers to Millerton and Millbrook, the original copies, so they could print them so we could distribute them. T I got to tell you this one story. Uh, Bill Sapay and I were going to Hudson, New York, to pick up a crane that we bought, they bought to use on the bridge. And on the way up, I casually said to Bill, I said, Bill, you know, why don't we meet with Ed Glody and see if we can work something out together? I thought he was going to throw me out of the truck. I mean, I can't tell you what he said to me. And it was the most quietest trip I ever had in my life going back. But I thought my career on the bridge was done. All right? So I never mentioned Ed Lodi's name to him again. But uh, it was that and uh, stringing wires and climbing. I, oh, I shouldn't tell you this if my wife ever sees what you're going to do here because I wasn't supposed to be climbing on the bridge. But we climbed on the bridge, under the bridge, over the bridge, through the bridge. And, and did a lot of, lot of pure, unadulterated labor, you know, just hard work. And we put the grates down, we took the railing down, we put the railing up, and, and we worked with many, many people. One of, one of my weaknesses is, is I can't remember names. I can remember a contract I drew up 25 years ago in every detail, but I can't tell you the guy's name I did it with. You know, but so I met a lot of beautiful, nice people on the bridge and spent a lot of time and put a lot of money out of their own pocket on there. You know, so we did about everything, you know. Can you describe what the community's response was when the bridge was briefly opened? Pardon? Can you describe what the community's response was when the bridge was that had that? Well, kind of there was a lot of talk when Ed had his project going. I thought it was interesting, but I really never got involved in it. But I really, I have no way of knowing what the community feeling was. I know whenever we was on the bridge, the people were there, 25, 30, 40, 50 people. Everybody was excited about it. You know, everybody thought it was an excellent idea. And even today, when, every, when people go up there, they're all in awe. They can't believe it, you know. So I, I really, really hope it becomes uh, a, a reality. So from a, could you describe some of your background in salvage, the salvage industry? Well, I was in the Navy. I was uh, in the Seabees. And uh, I did a big job in Guam. They pulled out the civilians, and they asked, Somebody recommended that I finish the job. We were building a big gantry, gantry crane. And, and I was only like a petty officer. No, I was a third class seaman then. So when they took me up to the commander, you know, asked me to finish the job, I said, who the hell is going to listen to me? You know, he says, you know, we'll get somebody that will give orders. And so I finished that job, and they wanted to reward me. So I said, well, send me to OCS, send me to this officer training school. He says, okay, you got it. So then he calls me up about a week later, and he said, what the hell are you trying to do to me? I said, why? He said, you don't even have high school, high school education. I said, well, what's that got to do with it? He said, I can't send you to officer training school. I said, well, you didn't think of that when I finished the gantry crane, did you? He said, Pete, I can't send you to school. 
He says, what, what else can I do? If I said, well, then send me home. Send me back to the States. So that's how I got in diving school. And I went, went down to Bayonne, New Jersey, and the first thing they did is put this helmet on you and put you in the river and water that's so black you couldn't tell where up was. So if you had claustrophobia, you, you was going to flunk right there, which we lost a bunch of guys that day. But I went down in the river in the mud and the piling, and I was holding on to the piling for dear life. And he, I was pulling the hose down, and I had the hose all piled up over. I couldn't see nothing, right? And he said, Sal, where are you going? I said, I'm walking around on here. I wasn't walking around. I was right down there, froze on that pole, right? And he says, well, come on back in. So we came back in, came up, and then we went through the rest of the course. You had to be a demolition expert. You had to be a, a, a diesel mechanic. You had to be a, a seaman. You had to be an expert in every field because you couldn't go out on the job and you're on the bottom and the compressor quits and I flunk compressors and Ed flunk, we all flunk compressors, right? You couldn't do that. So when you, when you had a demolition job, you had to know your job. When, when the compressor quit, we all had to fix it. We all, we all had to be the expert. Where you flunked is where you left the course. And I was lucky enough, I got through it. So that started my, my salvage career and then I went back to the Pacific and we worked in Guam and Agania Bay and Pearl and Midway and Saipan and Kwajalein, all the islands, you know, bringing up this and flattening ships and searching ships and stuff like that. So that's how my uh, salvage life started. And then when I came out, I kind of went into the salvage business. You know, I, I called up a, a guy that, uh, I can't think of his name now, but we were going to start a salvage business and we were buying equipment and everything else and they called him back from one of the wars and he came up from one of their ship and split his head and he got killed and uh, there's there's two plates on the side of a ship that keeps it from rolling and he came up and forgot it was there and it just split his head and he got killed calvin folks i just told you i couldn't remember names calvin folks and he and he got killed and and that ended my diving career and then my next opportunity when they put in the Ryan Cliff Kingston Bridge, I went up and looked for a job. And he says, nah, he said, we can't use you here. And I said, look, put me in a suit and put me on the bottom. See what I can do. And he says, nah, he says, you ain't getting no job. Here. And then I said, well, I'll just write to Washington for my own local and, form and get my own charter, right? He said, somebody's going to ground you on the job. So that's what ended my diving career. After that, I became a member of the Duchess Divers. And we worked for the sheriff's departments and stuff like that and did a lot of scuba diving and recovery work. But I never did do any more, any more hard hat diving. So you dived in the Hudson River? Oh, I started in the Hudson River and killed Van Cole in, in New Jersey. Our base was right there and I could look from my window out and see the Statue of Liberty. And it was as black as any telephone you could see. But that's where I started right there. And then I dove in the Hudson River a lot of times. I did jobs from Marist across the river, we put, we had a big pipeline that came out in the river and, and I embedded it in the solid rock with an inch and a quarter tool steel. And I said, yeah, that'll take care of that problem. Well, that win winter, the river froze. So when the Coast Guard kind of went up and down and the tide went out, the shore pulled in and it pulled that six inch pipe apart. So I dove there and then we worked on salvaging other little boats and waterfront jobs and stuff like that. But I never, never, never made a living from it anymore. Yeah, have you ever got a chance to dive near the bridge, at the base of the bridge? No, I've never, never dove around there. Matter of fact, they just, they just had somebody check those piers, and I tried to get word to him. I called Schaefer, the new chairman of the board, and told him because I know the people who tried to steal a bell. There was a bell on that footing, the closest to the, to the Poughkeepsie side. They were down there taking the bell, and I got it lifted up on top of the the railing, and then they dropped it. Lucky it didn't hit the guy in the boat or it killed him, right? But they said the bell must have been about 200 pounds, and it was on top. The pedestal was still there, and it worked with air or something, and it, it didn't, this plunger just came out and bang. It's, you know, it was like a foghorn thing, but I would like to have dived down there to see if I could find that bell, because I bet it's still down there. You know, it, I don't think it would move. It'd probably be in the mud. I've been in the, in the mud so deep, you had to put your hand up like this to see how deep you were in the mud. You know, you couldn't tell where up was, you couldn't tell where down was. I've, uh, I've taken a six inch hose with a jettison nozzle and, and tunneled under a submarine. And the, the hole keeps filling up behind you. And as you came up the other side, 
they would cut your lines and put new lines on, then we'd pull up a cable until we kept pulling bigger and bigger cables till we sunk huge, huge 5,000 gallon tanks to raise the ship and stuff like that. So I did a lot of salvage work, you know. I mean, I'm gonna tell you something else that, that it's gonna surprise you. I have claustrophobia. I went to a psychiatrist because I woke up one night and I was pulling the curtains off the windows and another time I was doing something else. I said, my God, I think I'm going crazy. I better go see somebody. And he told me I got claustrophobia and I laughed at him. I said, you gotta be an idiot or something. I got claustrophobia and I told him what I used to do. And he says, no, he says, uh, cat skinners and tree climbers and pilots, they do it for years and then one day it's all over. So I got claustrophobia now. I'd rather be in an elevator with a guy that knows he has claustrophobia than a guy that don't. Because if we're in an elevator, I'm watching you because if you don't know you got it, and you're gonna have a claustrophobia attack. Everybody in that elevator's in trouble because you're gonna go through the wall. Because that's another thing that I was in the airport and that door closed and God is the one that opened it because when he opened that door, I took off. And they ended up in the lobby and my brother had a hole in him and he said, what's the matter? He says, I don't know. And that was my first claustrophobia attack. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was an interesting life. So if your background in, in salvage, could you describe what would go into taking down the bridge? How we would go about well, it? Well, back in those days, like someone was saying before, you know, like Ed Lodi was saying, you know, you couldn't put a drop of paint in the river. But back in those days, we just literally cut it with a torch. And what I would do, I would take the last piece out they put in first because it was cantilevered over, right? So if I took this last piece out, cut it up with the torch, the, the bridge was still here, and I just cut, cut my way back to the shore. And then, you know, if for some unknown reason, if it fell in the river, I could, I could buy beaching gear, which were huge block and tackles. I mean, they were probably 10 shivs, probably four foot high. And we'd run two inch steel cable through them and huge winches. And we'd hook onto a ship on the beach and we'd almost tear it in two if we couldn't get it off. We, we lay up with a tug, we were on a tug, I was on a tug, and we'd put an anchor off starboard side and an anchor off the port side and one straight dead ahead, and we pulled on those till they set, and then we'd run the cable to the ship that was on the beach, and we'd either pull her in two, or pull the bollards out, or we'd pull it apart. And so we used to pull them off, you know, and then I, I did uh, a lot of the gauzing in the Panama Canal, that was, you couldn't see nothing, I mean, unbelievably black. We had these cylinders that had to be perfectly perpendicular and we sunk them in the mud. They called it degaussing. So I did a big job down there and I did big jobs in Guam. And it was uh, and it was a good job because back then I was getting $90 a month and when I was diving I was getting $5 an hour. Oh, I like that, you know. And then we got special food and special rations. We were treated like, you know, big shots, you know. Would you, how long did you, do you think it would have taken to take down the bridge? Oh, I never thought about it. I'd, I'd wake up before I got to getting it all down. Okay. I don't know how long it would have taken, you know. I just, just literally eat it piece by piece by piece, you know. And today I'm doing just the opposite. Today I would do anything. That's why I'm here. You know, I, I don't know why you, why you had me here, and I just thought that you want to talk to one of some of the people that worked on the bridge. So now I'm here trying to save it. And uh, I think it'd be a big economical factor for, for this whole area. I think that uh, people would get a spiritual feel when they get out there. They learn something about that. And another thing that nobody ever mentions, supposing, supposing the Mid-Hudson Bridge collapsed or, or the cables had to replace, and you'd either have to go to Kingston or you'd have to go to Newburgh or something else, but that bridge could still carry emergency vehicles. So we could make an emerg a way to get on that bridge for an emergency. I mean, nobody never talks about that, but you know, we could put fire engines across there. I don't think we could take traction. I think maybe we could take traction trailers across, but you know, we could surely get emergency vehicles back and forth. So that's that's one of the assets that, that nobody thinks about. And uh, I I just think people would come from all over the world to see it. How how much work do you think? based on what you've seen from up on top of the bridge, how much work would it go into to actually complete it more, do you imagine? I don't think it'd be any more than building a road. I mean, because that's what they're gonna do. They're gonna build a road across the top and put guardrails on the side of it. Instead of being guardrails, they're gonna be handrails and you know it's gonna be painted, but uh, it's gonna be an expensive job because anything you buy or do today, I mean, gas, $3 a gallon, 
I was talking to a welder the other day. He paid uh, $9 for a tank of gas to do special welding. The same tank today is $73. You know, I mean, I went, I did a brake job on my car this morning. The brake shoes were uh, 70, 70 some dollars and, and then for a, a quart of uh, brake fluid, and ended up with $80 just for parts. You know, when I was in the salva business, I'd sell a set of brake shoes for $3. You know, so it's going to be expensive, but it'd be the same as building a road. You know, so they'd have to build about a mile and a half road. And, and like Ed said, you know, we're going to paint it and paint it. I don't think we have to paint it. I, mean, I think just, just leave it on. I don't think it'll rust. I mean, you go look at it now. It's not. It's rusted. I mean, the, the biggest damage it got when the, the freight trains used to stop and they had salt salt in the, in the cars, you know, and the, the salt dripped on the bridge. And there are plates that are wore out and everything else, but the structure itself is, is well, they've had engineers that have said, uh, you know, it'll only last another 90 years. So the actual cost, I don't know, but. How long have you known uh, Ed Lodi? Oh God, we went back to, I think just before we got married, because he used to, he had an office down the street from us, and uh, my wife was the bookkeeper in Ferenz Interior Design. We got to know each other then. And then our paths crossed in different times, and, and he knew people that I knew, and then we went to dances together. And, and uh, I don't know, our life just seemed to cross a lot of times. So uh, how did uh, your relationship with Ed work when you were talking about tearing down the bridge and he's talking about building up the bridge? Well, I don't know. We it, we never it never was a big issue, you know. I mean, I didn't. I don't even know if I told him that I, that I was thinking about. I, I must have told him. I mean, when he showed me the picture, I must have. Yeah, I want to dream about tearing that down, right? And it was no big thing. I mean, he had his dream, and I had my dreams, and now my dream is the same as his. Okay. Um, one last question: How do you envision uh, this project going? Do you think that the bridge will be completed? Soon? I think. I think the. Know? I think the bridge will be. Con completed and unfortunately because of the political situation have now uh, Spitz was one of my big supporters but I think the emergency use of the bridge the, the economics the, the new employments they're going to have and people like I've been to Europe and and over there they build where 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 it's on the side of the mountain I mean we have condominiums here now they had condominiums there for years and years and years and I was in Venice, and they got all the bridges across the streets, and not all of them. A lot of them have stores and everything else on them. So this bridge is, you know, 100 years old already, and it's there. We could never rebuild it. We could never replace it. And a lot of people are going to get work, and, and I think it would be a big asset. I think it would be uh, for the emergency reason to cross the bridge. Uh, I just think it's a fantastic idea, and I'm proud to say that it was a part of it. I wish I could get Schaefer to let me put the flag up again because the flag hasn't been flying for years. And uh, I would be willing to sign the paper if I got hurt, to, you know. But we, we don't have a flag on the bridge, and I'd love to see the day when the flag is flying over that bridge again. Thank you very much. Good. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were. Good. Okay.